Well, I did my undergraduate degree here at Arizona State University. Um, started here in 2005, moved here until 2010. Um, and at the time when I started school here, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I had some ideas, maybe go into the film industry or doing something creative, um, or maybe do something in science. And um, I found that through some of the classes I took here, some of the professors really inspired me on the science side of things. It just got me fascinated about the earth and understanding you know, what the earth is made of and the processes that shape our, our planet and other planets. Just, I mean, geology really is, people think of it as the study of rocks, but it's really, it's the study of all the stuff that the universe is made out of um, and how this stuff got to be in the particular configuration that it's in today. So it's actually a very exciting field, and it's not just, I mean, looking at rocks is great, but it's, you know, it's more than that, really. Um, and specifically, the field that I'm in is, is called experimental petrology and volcanology. So volcanology is the study of volcanoes, and the experimental petrology part is, petro petrology is a term meaning this, literally the study of rocks, petra from the Greek rock. Um, and, but what it means is the study of the origins of rocks. So if you pick up a rock on the surface of the earth, you want to be able to look at it and tell someone else how it formed, how it got there. Um, and the experimental part is that we recreate the processes that form rocks in our laboratory. So things like, um, I'm specifically in the field of volcanology and so I'm interested in how volcanic rocks formed. So what we can do is take experimental equipment that can simulate the conditions inside of a magma chamber, for example. So very high pressures, very high temperatures, um, and we can create rocks in our lab and see what they look like and compare that to nature so we have some idea of how the rock in nature actually formed. So. Quick question then. How close have you come to real nature in, in some of these creations that you've made? Have you come really close in, in uh, duplicating the original? Yeah, we can get very close. So I'm, I'm talking about on the level of detail where it's almost impossible to distinguish the, the, a natural rock from one that we've created in the lab. Um, so we're looking at things like minerals that grow from a lava and the composition of those minerals and even the trace elements. So you know things that are in a crystal in, in parts per million. Um, and we can say, you know, we were able to, to grow this crystal that has so many parts per million of whatever element we're interested in and compare that to somewhere we've seen that in the real world. So we can come, we're looking at these things with tools that are very, very precise. So we have, we're taking a very, very zoomed in, very, very detailed look at the rocks. It's, people like to think that science is a lot of these eureka moments, and those happen, but I think they're pretty rare. Usually the moments that make, get us excited are what most people would consider trivial and minutia. So, you know, you've spent weeks trying to write down equations to get something just right to be able to work with the data that you have in a, in a way that's constructive and finally you you come up with this form of an equation that you know fits the data and tells a cool story like that's a good moment or um, when you um, try I do a lot of travel and I travel to a lot of uh, foreign places strange places that a lot of people don't get to go and a big thing for me is being to interact being able to interact with the people um, in other places and learning about their culture and learning about them and learning about how people live with volcanoes. Um, it's something that most people in the United States I think don't have a good appreciation for is what it means to live on the side of an active volcano. Um, so going to places where they deal with things like volcanic eruptions on maybe a weekly or monthly basis, they're dealing with ash fall covering their crops and their animals and their cars and things. Um, it's just in in interesting to see how people live like that. So. I think when you say what makes it worthwhile for me, it's it's the everything from the little moments where you're celebrating, you know, by yourself at your desk because you figured out a number, and it's you know the human cr connections that we create as well. Yeah, so I did my PhD on a volcano in Antarctica. Uh, it's called Mount Erebus. It's the southernmost active volcano in the world. Um, it's a really spectacular place. It's a large volcano, um, kind of a, like a stratocone shape, you know. And, but what's really cool about it, well, there's a lot of things that are really cool about it, but one of the coolest features of Erebus is that it has an active lava lake in the summit crater. So you can walk up to the crater and look down into the crater and you actually see a bubbling pot of liquid magma right there at the surface. And you know, what we think it is is basically the top, you know, there's this idea that you have magma chambers underground, some 
storage region where magma is sitting in the crust. And then you have conduits, cracks, and things that make it to the surface, and that's how lava gets to the surface. And the idea is that this is like the, you know, that someone's just sweeped away everything on top of one of those cracks, and you're looking straight into the conduit that's connected to the underground magma system. So that's, it's a really rare feature. There are a number of volcanoes in the world that have them, but um, there's only a handful that have ones that are persistently active. So um, like Kilauea sometimes has a lava lake, sometimes doesn't. There are other volcanoes that have them periodically, but Erebus has had one since its discovery a couple hundred years ago. And there's only a few volcanoes in the world that can say that. Um, and it's just, it's, you know, normally all this stuff, it, the, usually the top of a volcano, it looks like a pile of steaming rocks. Um, because the, the magma system is you know, underground and it hasn't reached, quite reached the surface. So the ability to, you know, people often write about Erebus in, in scientific literature as a sort of window into the magma system, a window into the underground plumbing system of the magma, um, which is the thing that I'm interested in studying is this underground stuff. And so the ability to actually look right at the top of the magma chamber essentially is pretty exciting scientifically. It is diff it's obviously very difficult to get into North Korea, um, but there is this huge volcano that straddles the border between North Korea and China, um, China being just to the north. And uh, in about 2002, 2005, in that period of a few years, there were a lot of small seismic events right at the volcano. It's what we call a seismic swarm, meaning a lot of very small earthquakes, but all kind of concentrated in the same area. Um, and that happens at volcanoes very frequently, and it usually means that magma or fluids or something is moving around underground, which can lead to an eruption. But uh, whether or not it leads to an eruption, it signifies that the volcano is active, it's doing something. And so that got the attention of a lot of people in the region. Um, the North Koreans started looking at this more closely, the South Koreans, the Chinese, Japanese, etc. The whole region became more interested when this volcano sort of woke up. Um, partly because it was waking up and partly because it's had very large eruptions in the past. Um, it's probably largest eruption is called the Millennium Eruption and it happened about a thousand years ago. Um, so during human history, you know, humans were in the area um, and it was one of the biggest volcanic eruptions that's happened in recorded human history. So in the last few thousand years, this is one of the biggest volcanic eruptions we've had on the earth. Um, so the idea that a volcano that was capable of something like that is sort of stirring again um, got people interested. Um, I got involved via my PhD supervisor. Um, at the time I was a PhD student and he was, was brought in by people in North Korea and people in China who were collaborating to try to get a group of external people to come in to work with North Koreans. So it's very much a um, collaborative effort. Um, you know, about half the team was from outside of uh, the, the DPRK, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, and the other half was from the inside of the DPRK. So, and that's, and that's the way that we were able to do science there is because we went in hand in hand with the Koreans to work with them on this volcano. Um, and I think everyone, it, it's, it's, it's something I'm really proud of being a part of because it's, I think, been a very successful collaboration. Um, it's not something that has been easy to accomplish, but I think because both sides, the scientists on both sides, were always very willing to, to help each other out, and they, we all had the same goals, you know, we all wanted to understand this volcano better. And so the scientists on all sides were very happy to work together and share data and, and everything. There was no ownership over it. Um, so it was just about us coming together and trying to navigate the weird political landscape that exists to get us in the country, to get our instruments in the country. We were able to bring some of them to the UK um, and to China for meetings, to be able to meet and sit down and work with the data. So these were things that, you know, and I can't take credit for getting this stuff done. This is people like a guy named James Hammond, who's been um, one of the PIs of the project, who's done, who's been instrumental in getting this work done, and Clive Oppenheimer, my, my PhD supervisor. Um, and it's just a ton of other people who have been instrumental in getting that part of it done. Um, I feel lucky to have been asked to join the team to do my science, to bring the skill that I have to, you know, to hopefully be able to share, you know, my knowledge and expertise with 
people in North Korea and with the rest of the team. Yeah, so I've, I've always been a Trekkie from a young age, you know, watched Star Trek The Next Generation growing up with my parents, um, and it was something that always inspired me to um, want to explore, to want to learn more about my world. When I watched it, the things that I saw were, um, you know, exploration, meeting new people, um, understanding how the universe works. Those are the things that I got out of Star Trek, and also just sort of a um, an attitude of, you know, love each other, understand each other, accept each other. Um, there's a saying in Star Trek, it's infinite diversity and infinite combinations, which is a Vulcan saying. And um, I think that really encapsulates the ideals of Star Trek is, you know, love each other, accept each other. Um, and humanity is about trying to better yourself and make yourself a better person. And so these were these really noble pursuits, right, that I grew up with. And, um, you know, we could argue about whether or not they're realistic, but I think I definitely carried that with me. Um, growing up and certainly it had an influence in me choosing to go into science. Um, like I said, I had been sort of choosing between maybe doing something in film creatively or doing something in science, but I, I always wanted, if I was going to do film, it was probably going to be science fiction. You know, this, this exploration idea was something that I always felt connected to. So I think Star Trek has been this thread throughout my life that's, that's certainly shaped the way I see the world and has certainly shaped the, the things that I've chosen to do um, and so now I'm I'm currently the editor-in-chief of trekmovie.com which is the largest um, unofficial Star Trek website so it's completely run by fans um, it's a fun way to um, you know meet other like-minded people and discuss things like you know space exploration where do we think it's gonna go in our in our lifetime and is Star Trek a realistic or even a good future, should that be what we're aiming for? So, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely think that the, the two, science and Star Trek for me, are really interconnected.